And welcome to Wellness Live. My name is Dr. Olivia Moses, and you have joined us for a wonderful segment today. This segment is brought to you by the Living Whole Wellness Program here at Loma Linda University Health. Well, have you ever thought about what you eat every day? Well, of course you have, because we all eat every day. And have you ever thought about food as medicine? That what you eat actually can fight disease. Well, today we're going to be talking about a very important topic that is food and how it fights cancer. I have a very special guest with me today. His name is Andrew Woodward. He has been a nutritionist dietitian here at the, our cancer center for eight years. And I have invited him to talk about how food affects cancer and how we can fight cancer with our everyday foods. Thank you, Olivia, and welcome everyone. On my first slide, you probably see an apple, and you've probably heard an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, I like to add garlic keeps everybody away, unless, of course, you like garlic. So as I present the information here, I just want you to understand that food is very complex. There's a lot of biologically active substances in one apple. And while you're thinking about that, I'll share a few of those. You might think about vitamins, minerals, fiber. You might think about carbohydrates, fat, protein. Um, there's anti-inflammatory substances in not only apple, but a lot of plant foods, fruits and vegetables. And as you eat those every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they provide a lot of very beneficial um, nutrients for you. In fact, one apple can contribute over 700 biologically active substances. In fact, the skin of an apple, if you buy organic, is probably a good idea so you can eat the skin without any um, distress or any guilt. Um, the skin of the apple has 12 different terpenoids. It has quercetin, it has fiber, potassium. Most of the potassium is in the skin of the apple. But not, let me talk about some other foods as well. Um, think about this, the foods that we eat every day can help reduce the risk of developing chronic medical conditions. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, good for the skin, good for the eyes as well. As a matter of fact, even if you are unfortunate and you have cancer already, it's not too late to start incorporating some of these colorful plant-based foods to help reduce um, chemotherapy side effects and to also help um, with the chemotherapy to also prevent the recurrence of the cancer. Um, so I like to have my patients focus on eating the good stuff. I like to have my patients and my students focus on playing with the food. What I mean by that is be creative with spices, do smoothies, add vegetables in different ways that you hadn't thought of before. And finally, get inspired by reading some good material, by reading some um, internet information, but be careful with that. Sometimes you get stuff on the information, it can be misleading. Talk to people, get some good recipes, and have fun. Play with your food. So, think about foods that you can include every day in a healthy diet. So, first of all, is your dark greens. That's your spinach, your kale, your broccoli, a lot of those greens, including cruciferous vegetables, which is also my number two. Some people like raw. In fact, it's a common understanding that when you have raw greens, they're healthier. Well, they are healthier if you want to get all the B vitamins. Because the B vitamins are heat sensitive and water sensitive, cooking them or overcooking them will reduce some of the B vitamin content. However, on the other hand, when you cook them, it makes some of the minerals like potassium, calcium, iron more bioavailable, so absorption will be better. And I think that's an important point to consider if one is a vegan or a vegetarian and not getting a lot of milk or dairy in their diet. So use the greens. Um, if you like to use smoothies, greens work really, really well with a smoothie. As a matter of fact, this morning I had half greens, which was spinach, half berries, and I loaded up on the mint. Since mint is now growing in my garden, it was a mint vanilla smoothie and it tasted great. So you can do a lot of creative things with your greens, with your smoothies. Number three, berries. I already shared that berries are wonderful in smoothies, but they make a great topping for yogurt. 
the berries, think about the blues, the purples, the reds, um, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, all those berries, wonderful health benefits. The color itself tips off the fact that they're loaded with a pigment called anthocyanin. Anthocyanin is noteworthy because it helps reduce inflammation. And inflammation is probably at the core of many of the different types of cancers I see. Okay? Um, so berries are good and whole fruit. When I say whole fruit, I'm trying to put the focus on whole as in including the skin. A lot of times people find it easier to drink the juice, but you're missing the fiber, you're missing a lot of the benefits like in the apple skin, the skin of the blueberries, and the skin of many of those other whole fruits, and um, not the citrus skin, that's a little bit bitter, but get the pulp and get the whole fruit when you get citrus. Citrus has some triterpenoids, it has limonoids, it has vitamin C, it has a lot of wonderful health benefits. Um, number four is use whole unprocessed grains. Some of those are starchy foods and I realize many people are on a lower carbohydrate diet but you can still include those. The whole grains have the fiber. In fact, if, you, if you're choosing between white rice and brown rice, use the brown rice. Why is that? Because it contains the hull, it contains the fiber, and that provides a lot of other health benefits, including 10 to 20 times more magnesium, 10 to 20 times more zinc, which is good for the immune system. Magnesium is good for your heart and muscles. There is a substance called inositol hexaphosphate, abbreviated IP6, that's found in brown rice. In fact, if you type it in on your internet search, you'll see that many companies are selling you that. So my suggestion is instead of buying that capsule, use your brown rice. Yes, it does cook a little bit longer, but then you can get the benefits of that IP6, which has probable cancer-fighting benefits. Potatoes are not off limits, but include those with the skin. Sweet potatoes are great, oatmeal, barley, and even include quinoa. If you haven't tried quinoa, try that out. At a later time, I could tell you some quick and easy recipes, but we're on a time budget right now. So plant-based protein foods are wonderful. You don't have to rely on meat. In fact, vegetarians can get plenty of protein if you do it in a smart way. So get your beans, get your quinoa, get your lentils, get your nuts and your seeds. And if you're a lacto-ovo vegetarian, that allows dairy, soy milk, and even eggs. So you can get plenty of protein that way as well. Then the seasoning. Seasonings are just a gold mine of ways to explore seasoning combinations. Um, this morning I had some um, leftovers and I had some garlic and garlic goes a long way for seasoning the foods. Garlic and onions are in the same family so I use those a lot. Um, using dry seasonings are wonderful because you've got that little glass container and they will last for at least a year. Maybe longer depending on how they're stored. If you go for fresh seasonings um, during springtime it might be a good idea to grow your garden. You can grow rosemary, oregano, mint, a lot of different uh, seasonings, and that way you have the fresh, you have the um, dry that's in your cabinet, and have fun with experimenting with your seasonings. Number seven is drink water. Drink water in decaffeinated green tea, especially if you're sensitive to caffeine. Green tea has some cancer-fighting benefits. Number eight, vitamin D. Vitamin D has really... Um, a lot of noteworthy benefits in terms of fighting cancer, strengthening the immune system, it helps with calcium absorption, and much, much more. Since vitamin D is rather undependable in food sources and getting too much sun exposure has other health risks, it's probably a reasonable idea to get a supplement of vitamin D. So I think at this point we'll take a, a pause and answer some questions. Well, thank you, Andy. That's a lot of information, but very good information. So when we're thinking about food as medicine or fighting cancer, and, you know, sometimes it can get very complicated. Being a dietitian, nutritionist, thinking about all of these compounds, what would be a simple thing for someone to remember? Maybe about colors, let's say. Well, I was thinking that when you gave me my clue anyway. <laughs> so I always tell my patients, eat the colors of the rainbow. 
So you eat the reds, the orange, the yellows, the greens, the indigo, violets, and that gets the berries, that gets the greens, that gets your beta carotene and the yellow orange fruits and vegetables, your carrots. Um, so that's a good starting point. Also, sometimes less is better. What I mean by that is less processing. So if you get the whole oats that have less processing than the processed oats, if you have the whole grains, which is less processed than the white refined grains, same thing for the rice, that's a good place to start. Okay, wonderful. And also I want to let you know that you can actually ask Andy live questions. So go ahead and type them in if you're watching us live today. Here's a question, Andy. Can you speak to the anti-inflammatory value of turmeric? Turmeric's a hot topic right now. Yes, I didn't mention that on my spices mm -hmm. or seasonings before. Turmeric has a lot of benefits that really kind of originated from the subcontinent of India. It's very popular in the Indian food. I like mm -hmm. that. And so I like to look at the research and what the internet, especially PubMed, which is where you get the original research from the original researchers. Mm -hmm. It probably has six or seven separate mechanisms that have cancer-fighting benefits. It provides antioxidants, and as you mentioned, it reduces inflammation. It turns on a process called apoptosis, which tells the body to attack those abnormal cells. And it has other mechanisms which are really quite complex. So turmeric with the active phytochemical curcumin is a good seasoning to incorporate every day or several times a week. And also, if we can say, um, turmeric um, can be put into many, many things, right? You know, so it doesn't always have to be in savory things. It can Absolutely. be in, you know, um, maybe throw it in a smoothie, I don't know. I have tried that, uh -huh. and one time I found out to my regret that I added a little bit too much. Oh. <laughs> So the trick is when you add turmeric to a smoothie, it depends on what you want, but just add a little bit mm -hmm. and a it goes bit. along. And you way. can make drinks out of it, all kinds of fun things. Absolutely. So with that, so it, it lives up to its hype then, turmeric? I believe bit? it does. Okay. So another question here is when we're looking at um, cancer fighting foods, and a lot of people think about cancer in older people and we have to start worrying about cancer when we're adults and that type of thing. When is it a good time to actually start fighting cancer or worrying about these foods in our children? Well, as an adult, I think there's never too late a time. But as an adult, you always have your children's eyes following you. They are like little sponges. They say what you say. They do what you do. So if you want to have a positive um, um, impression on younger minds, your children, eat the greens, eat the berries, use the smoothies. In fact, soups are kind of the equivalent of a smoothie because you can put just about everything in a mm -hmm. soup, and that's good when the weather is cold. Okay, wonderful. So one last question for this segment, and again, we'll have another segment that you can ask your questions at the end of Andy's presentation. So with some of these things, if, let's say, you have a picky person, whether it's a spouse or whether it's a child, and you want them to start eating these things because they haven't been used to it, what's a kind of tip you can give these individuals? That can be a tough one. So I try to explore what the person likes to begin with. Before I start to give them my suggestions, I want to find out what their tolerance is. If they like sweets, if they like savory, if they like vegetables, or if they're predominantly a meat eater. So I, I kind of base my suggestions off of that. I find smoothies can be doctored up or adjusted to meet just about anybody's taste profile. Um, but sweets, um, soups, um, sauces, you can come up with a lot of different creative ideas. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, we will have another segment, but again, type them in and we'll ask Andy. Andy? Thank you. I have a few more ideas on terms of what to eat every day. Um, one thing that's not on my list, but I, I really feel compelled to share, is exercise. Um, exercise is safe for people even if they're going through cancer treatment. That sounds a little bit hard to believe, but there's been some new studies published out of Australia that show when people are going through chemotherapy, which is very harsh, if the treatment is tailored and if the exercise is tailored to what the person can tolerate, they have a much better um, success with the treatment. The treatment is more effective. 
The patients have less neuropathy. The patients have less nausea. They have better energy. They sleep better. And so that's something I want to pass along. I don't have time to give you the guidelines, but you want to start slow, maybe with some gentle walking, with some comfortable shoes that fit you comfortably, and then walk for five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever you can do. There are a few things that I want to share that we might want to avoid because these are common in American diet and you might want to avoid too much meat, especially processed red meat. In 2016, the World Health Organization came out in writing and they said that processed red meat is probably carcinogenic. So I would say go easy on your bacon, your salami, your sausage, the wonderful hot dogs for some of you, and the bologna and so on. So go easy on those. You want to process, avoid meats, especially when they have sodium nitrite, which is a common preservative. Now, if you're a lunch meat person, look for those that have on the label nitrite free. Um, so I, I'm conflicted with the next one. I love a barbecue, but when you barbecue or you char the meat, when you heat it at a high temperature, it creates two different categories of cancer-causing substances. So what you want to do is limit the amount of meat that you eat, or maybe what you do is you heat it up a little bit first, and then you finish it on the grill. So that way it's not cooked, and getting those grill lines and cooked that um, create those um, carcinogenic compounds. Um, foods that are pickled might be a zesty, tangy flavor, but if you eat too much of those, probably just about every day, that can be associated with a problem. Better than briny, salty foods, better to get um, fermented foods. Try some naturally fermented kimchi or sauerkraut or probiotics and yogurts and so on. Um, also avoid excess fats. We know that fats can be associated with obesity, but it's also led to more oxygenation or oxidative damage, I should say. And so you want to watch out for hydrogenated fats. You want to watch out for too much vegetable oils. Vegetable oils are high in something called omega-6 fat, which is associated with more inflammation. And of course, you want to watch out for trans fats. Um, alcohol is a problem. Um, the National Cancer Institute suggests that even one drink a day may be um, a problem and they cannot consider that to be safe. Um, it's not right known how many drinks of alcohol can be consumed, but right now it's probably safe to drink tea or coffee or other beverages instead of tea, instead of alcohol. Well, I messed up on that one. Um, Avoid excess calories. And so excess calories lead to body fat, especially the abdominal visceral fat that can be pro-inflammatory. That abdominal fat can also lead to excess production of estrogen. So I have a few more thoughts before we finish. People ask me, students ask me, what's the best diet to eat? And really, I say that there's not one diet that fits everybody except perhaps the traditional Mediterranean diet or the traditional Asian diet. Both of those are largely plant-based with minimum amount of meat, and they use healthy oils, Mediterranean oil. Mediterranean diet obviously uses olive oil, and the Asian diet uses between sesame oil. Sometimes they use peanut oil as well. And both of those are rich in fruits and vegetables that contribute cancer-fighting phytochemicals that are also good for reducing heart disease risk and other chronic medical conditions. So we have a great question coming in here, um, Andy. There's a lot of buzz about juicing and how you can stuff more uh, good stuff and cancer fighters in juice. So what are your thoughts about juicing? I think juicing is advantageous to get more vegetables and some fruit in the diet. However, I also like the idea of smoothies because smoothies actually keep the fiber. Fiber is thought to be cancer preventive and it's also a little bit less cleanup when you do the smoothies. So I like them both mm -hmm. and depending on what your personality type is and it depending on what equipment you have at home. 
Okay, great. So we have another one. Uh, question is, how would you contrast and compare a plant-based diet versus a ketogenic diet in terms of anti-inflammatory? They're getting real technical on us. Yes, well, a ketogenic diet is something that maybe you've heard of. It's a very low carbohydrate diet. The idea is to keep the carbohydrates to less than 40 or 50 grams a day so that your body turns on this ketosis process. Um, and when you do that, you severely restrict the amount of carbohydrates, fruits, whole grains, and to some degree vegetables as well. So I would much rather go with a plant-based diet, which is a little bit heavier or a lot heavier with the carbs, mm -hmm. but you get the colorful fruits and vegetables that I think provide anti-inflammatory benefits. Okay, wonderful. So another question here is um, when we get herbs and spices and we think about herbs and spices we have kind of our go-to's you know in our, mm -hmm. in our in our cabinet is there anything out there that you say you know what you should try this it's actually delicious and you might not have ever thought about it yes seasonings to me are a wonderful opportunity to season the food for culinary benefits but also to add some zip and to add anti-inflammatory benefits antioxidants for example, gram per gram, ounce per ounce, the dry seasonings provide more antioxidant benefits than some of these noteworthy supermarketed fruits like goji berry and asahi mm. berry and so on. So we mentioned turmeric already, uh -huh. but I like ginger, I like garlic, I like basil, I like oregano. Um, though, so there's a, a wonderful a bunch of opportunities for you. Mm -hmm. By the way, I should say this about tomatoes. Uh -huh. Tomatoes we don't think of as a seasoning, but as a condiment, tomatoes have lycopene, that red pigment that's so good for the heart and also good to help reduce prostate cancer risk. Okay, wonderful. Now, I know there is a lot of information out there, but maybe you can clarify it between fresh tomatoes and cooked tomatoes and which one should we eat? Okay. Actually, with the lycopene, it's better to cook the tomatoes. That allows the lycopene to be better absorbed. Cooking with a little bit of olive oil uh, would be the best way to obtain that lycopene. I've also heard you talk about garlic, about chopping it and letting it rest. Could you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, garlic's a fun seasoning. It's so volatile and sometimes people call it the stinking rose because it does have quite an aroma. And to actually take advantage of the diol sulfides and the adjohene, and there's so many different phytochemicals, mm -hmm. you want to crush it, smash it, mince it, and then leave it for 10 minutes. The secret is just leaving it alone before you add it to your cooked sauce. If you're going to eat it raw, you can eat it anytime you want, mm -hmm. but not too many people are fond of raw right. garlic. <laughs> well, we have another question. You mentioned vegetable oil potentially being bad. What about coconut oil? Coconut oil, that's another hot press item now. Yeah, co coconut oil is a lot of fun to talk about. It. It's not my favorite, but it's in my top three. Okay. And I would normally go with olive oil, then canola oil, then um, coconut oil. It does have a lot of medium chain triglycerides. So that's a real unique benefit in terms of it being absorbed and used most rapidly for energy rather than being stored as most fats that are longer chains they typically do. Coconut oil adds a wonderful aroma, smell to the, the foods, and I like to use it, especially when you want to get that tropical or Asian flavor in your foods. Speaking of Asian flavor and spice, I'm on a Thai basil kick. So one of the things that I, you know, would suggest everyone to do is go, when you go to the grocery store next, pick out something you've never tried before and experiment. What do you think about that? I think that's a wonderful idea, although a lot of my patients are a little bit reluctant to do that. One of my favorite cuisines is Thai food, and getting the basil and the eggplant and those wonderful seasonings is just a home run as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, another question that we have coming in is if I... Um, Oh, we have just another one, so let me finish this one first. In terms of coconut oil, expeller pressed or cold pressed, which one captures the richer nutrient content? Let's do that until cold, we'll go to the next one. Cold press is definitely, um, or tends to be the generally the, the better way to go. Mm -hmm. 
and cold press is going to be using a much, much lower heat, so it contains the natural polyphenols that are present in the natural oil, whereas oftentimes they're reduced when it's expeller or heat pressed. Okay, wonderful. So now to the next question that goes on to olive oil. Now they say first pressed and there's all these terms. Is there something better than the other? Extra well, virgin and you know all of these. Yeah, there's terms. a lot of different ways that they get olive oil. Generally speaking, for the purest, the extra virgin olive oil, which is the first pressing of the fruit, you're going to get less of the tannins, less of the bitterness. So you're going to get the pure flavor. It's going to be more um, um, volatile oils, and you're going to have a, a nice color to it. Um, you get processed olive oil, which is a little bit different. And processed olive oil, even though it sounds bad, has a higher smoke point. So you can actually do some frying with the processed olive oil, whereas the extra virgin olive oil, generally you want it for, for lower temperature salad dressings or lower temperature cooking below 350 degrees. Wonderful. In general, we've talked a lot today about how we can fight cancer. Now, I know you work with cancer patients every day. Is there something that um, we need to know if I have cancer and I'm going through treatment, what I need to know about my diet? That's a huge question, but are there some take home messages you would tell someone? So you're referring to a patient that's going through cancer treatment? Mm -hmm. Well, for one, it's a tough process, but you want to arm yourself with good information because information reduces the fear significantly. You want to get good information, and sometimes the internet's a little bit tricky to discern what's healthy and what's just common uh, that's not true. So you want to be able to eat enough calories to keep the weight stable. Generally speaking, normal sized meals may be too much if you have a little bit of nausea. Mm -hmm. So smaller meals that are more frequent, instead of three meals a day, maybe you go with three smaller meals and a couple snacks. Um, fruit smoothies might be a good way to add some protein powder to kind of get enough protein. And you just kind of play it by ear. Ginger helps calm the stomach. Mint can calm the stomach. Um, avoiding fried foods. Sometimes cooking that we normally associate with a very aromatic, very pleasant smell, mm -hmm. that can be too much and that might trigger some nausea. Okay, but the same rules apply for the types of foods we all should be eating. All of the rules apply for prevention and treatment except for a couple, and that's taking supplements. Mm -hmm. Supplements, you want to be careful that you don't overdo antioxidants in pill form. Mm -hmm. And antioxidants are great for reducing oxidation, preserving and protecting DNA, but you want to get them from foods, not from pills. Well, with that, I just want to say thank you, Andy. Um, as you can all know, uh, see today that Andy is very knowledgeable about this topic. And he, we do a cooking class or a cooking demo with Cancer Fighting yes, Foods here at Loma Linda for some of our cancer patients and for our employees. So if you're one of our Loma Linda employees and would like to know more, please visit us on our website, livingwhole.llu.edu. That's livingwhole.llu.edu. And if you have enjoyed today's segment, you can see this segment and many more on demand on our website as well and as you can see that would be our website now here on the screen now also do not forget we are here every single month so next month we are actually going to be talking about autism so if you have any of your friends and family that really want to know more about autism we have two huge experts here on our campus to maybe clarify some myths and give you some really great information my name is dr olivia moses and thank you for joining us <music>